after getting barely three hours of sleep. I somehow managed to get to the Parsky Public Library at 9 a.m. on the dot. I scanned the room but couldn't see Emmy anywhere. Just a small crowd of people hosting what looked like a book club. Psst, Ty! They whipped around and saw a sight that was so bizarre, it took my brain a second to catch up to my eyes. Emmy and the elderly woman from last night were sitting in the children's book section, sitting on plastic stools with a small blue and yellow table in between them. They both had a mug of tea in front of them, the old woman eagerly taking a sip from hers as she saw me approach. Oh man, you mean I missed out on sharing what I read this week? I joked as I grabbed a small stool, sitting down at the table. Emmy smacked me on the arm. Shh. Okay, okay. I reluctantly lowered my voice. Ah, young love, the woman said, smirking behind her cup of tea. I remember when I used to chase boys around at your age. Emmy let out a sound that was somewhere between a nervous cough and an anxious laugh, inadvertently causing the tea in her throat to surge back into her mouth. The result rendered her unable to speak due to a coughing fit, and left it for me to clarify that we weren't actually together. Um, I think what she's trying to say is that we're not dating, I said to the woman. Well, I think you'd make a great couple, she says, slyly nudging me as Emmy wiped her mouth with a tissue. I definitely had a crush on Emmy in high school. We had been friends since we were young, after all. Unfortunately, being a teenager, I never worked up the courage to tell her. I'd always thought she was cute, but now any kind of romance seemed impossible, given we lived in different cities. Thanks for the advice. What's your name, by the way? I asked. I'm Annie. I'm sorry if I scared you the other night, she apologized, putting her hand on my arm. I didn't mean to frighten you. Anyway, said Emmy, who are you? How do you know us? And what do you know about that thing in the tank? Annie took a deep breath, bringing her arms close to her chest. A mournful look spread over her face as she seemed to heavily contemplate what she was about to say. Margaret was my sister, she said finally. We grew up here. We didn't have much, but we made do. Margie, though. Anne slowly rubbed her eye patch, pressing two fingers to the leather and massaging it rhythmically. She had trouble mentally. She often saw things that weren't there. Or she'd get really worried about things that were never true. My ma never really understood it, I guess, in her world. Mental health was something that was considered taboo and never really treated as a real issue. So she rushed it under the carpet. Never took Margie to see anyone. It was up to me to keep her sane, which I tried my best to do because I was her big sister and I loved her. I think I was the only real person she ever trusted during those years. She was teased relentlessly at school, and while she was superb... Academically, her teachers always kept their distance. They never really understood her. Annie paused, looking into the hazy tea in her mug. I realized that both me and Emmy had begun to lean in closer to her, so close that well, we could see the inside details of her cup. But she found a man. She got married. She had a family. All of which was really good for her. She loved her son more than life itself she said, still peering down into her cup. That's why the day when Michael fell into the water tank... Ah. She trailed off, staring off into space. Now at this point, Emily and I practically were face to face with her, and I could see the tears beginning to well up in her one visible eye. I'm sorry, Annie said, pulling a handkerchief out of her leather purse and dabbing at her eye with it. It's okay, I assured her. So her son drowned in a water tank? asked Emily. Anne nodded. Margie went out to do the shopping and left little Mike home with her husband. He took a nap and Mikey got bored, so he went out to the back and started fooling around. The tank wasn't locked up or anything, and... Well, he fell in. He couldn't get out. I couldn't imagine how horrible it must have been for him. Ah! She cried out in pain, clutching her eye patch and rubbing it vigorously. I wondered what was underneath that patch that was causing her so much pain, and why she had been rubbing it so much since she started the story. 
Maybe she was still internalizing some of the trauma from it. Are you okay? I asked, not really sure how to help. I'm fine, she said. Her face contorted into a grimace. Sometimes when I talk about this, she plays up. She? Quizzed Emily. Oh, Annie said, waving Emily off. Yes, yes, I'll get to that. Taking another deep breath, she continued with her story. When Margie found out what happened, she couldn't take it. She was destroyed, as any mother who had lost their child so young would be. But for her, it was worse. Mentally, she became unhinged. She couldn't cope with it. I spoke to her on the phone, and it was horrific. Then she began accusing me of stealing her boy. That rang a bell in my mind. The zombie woman, or I guess I should say zombie Marge, was screaming at us for her boy when we were in the tank. I tried so hard to tell her that I had not and would not ever do something like that, especially as her only sister, but she wouldn't listen. And that's when she got physical. Annie winced in pain, but she clutched her right hand with her left as if to prevent herself from rubbing her eye patch. She attacked you, I said. That's how I got this. Annie pointed to the eye patch with a small smile. Nearly scratched my eye out because she thought I had masterminded everything. What happened to her? asked Emily. The eye I could save. Margie, on the other hand. Annie paused. Her face twisted with sorrow. After she left me in a pool of blood, she locked herself in the bathroom. By this time, her husband Rick had woken up and was trying to figure out what the hell was happening, but she refused to come out. I still remember lying there, watching Rick pounding on the door desperately, calling her name over and over again. Then there was the most horrible sound, and a flash of light so bright I could have been blinded in the other eye if I wasn't careful. She killed herself? Emily said, her voice barely a whisper. Annie gave a small nod to confirm her statement. In the bathtub, with a hairdryer. Margie's who we saw in the tank then, I said, turning back to Annie. I hate to think what's become of her, Annie responded. It's definitely not the sister I knew. When you saw us at the cemetery, you said... The eye sees what she sees, I continued. What did you mean by that? Annie gripped her left hand with her right hand as she spoke, pinning it to the table. Yes, um, I'm half blind in my right eye. It's practically useless, so I wear this patch. But every now and then I... see things. It began shortly after her funeral. I woke up in the middle of the night, and all I could see in my right eye was... It was. Annie searched for the right words as her voice wavered. It was like I was underwater and I was looking up at the surface. You mean you were looking through her eyes while she was in the tank? I asked. Yes. And it only got worse from there. A few years later, I saw you two and your friend. That night you visited, I... I saw everything. And ever since that night, I began getting flashbacks... I relived what I saw happen a thousand times over. Your faces were etched into my memory, so much that I even began to feel your presence in Parsky when you returned. That was how I found you at the cemetery last night. A silence fell over the table as Emily and I contemplated what she told us. The memories rushing back of the unrecognizable thing we had encountered inside the tank that night. I couldn't bring myself to tell Annie anything about what her sister had become. It was a fate worse than death. The silence was broken by Emmy, who stood up out of her seat and began shouting at Annie, completely ignoring the fact that we were in a library. Why didn't you do anything? She said, stabbing an accusatory finger at her. You saw what was going on. You could have called the cops. Emily shook as she spoke. Her eyes blazed with the fire of a thousand suns. It was actually kind of scary to see. It was just... I was glad I wasn't on the other end. I didn't know if what I was seeing was real. I... I thought I was hallucinating until I... I read about it in the paper. Annie stammered, putting her hands up in defense. Emily slammed her fist onto the table and stared daggers at Annie. 
Jeremy died and you could have saved him. With that, she stormed off, a number of onlookers murmuring as she slammed the library door behind her. I sat there awkwardly for a moment before returning my eyes to Annie, who looked like she'd just seen a ghost. Um, I should probably check on her, I said. But before I could get out of my seat, I felt the pincer-like grip of Annie's hand on my arm. If you go back, she said, pulling something out of her pocket, and you give this to her? Annie placed a black and white photograph in my hand. It was a young boy, looking no older than six. He was smiling, clutching a basketball in his hands. Maybe Margie will find what she's searching for. And he said, using her wrinkled hand to close mine over the photo. I couldn't really think of what else to say, but thanks. Before rushing out the door after Emily leaving Annie to try to explain what all the noise was about. I found Emily standing outside, her back pressed up against the library wall and a cigarette between her lips. She pulled it away and exhaled smoke into the air as she saw me approach. Sorry, it's... It's been a while since my last one, Emily said. Her cheeks turned a shade of pink as she flicked ash onto the ground. I didn't know you smoked, I said, taking up a position next to her. Well, it's actually my first in like a year. I quit because I... Well, I guess the stress of this whole thing is getting to me. I get you. I didn't mean to blow up in there. It's okay. No, really, that was dumb of me. Emily gave me a genuinely apologetic look before adding, What's that? And she gestured to the photo I held in my right hand. For a moment, I forgot I'd even been holding it, but uncurled my fist and gave it to her. Annie gave it to me. It's Margaret's son. Emily studied the photo for a moment, pursing her lips. Poor kid. She told me to give it to her. If we went back. I added that last part hesitantly, not knowing how Emily would react to the suggestion. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to return to the tank. But somehow, it felt like the right thing to do. After everything Annie had told us, I almost felt like I was obligated to do something about Margaret. If there was a way to fix her, to prevent other young children from dying, we might as well give it our best shot. The first time we visited the tank, we had no idea what we were doing. At least now, we had some idea. Emily handed the photo back to me and dropped the butt of her cigarette to the ground. She mashed it under the heel of her black combat boot. We could die, Tyler. Emily made eye contact with me as she spoke, her blue pupils peering into mine. She, she hardly ever called me Tyler, only when she was being serious. I don't want to be responsible for... for you too. She lowered her gaze to the ground. I put my arm on her shoulder, giving it a squeeze. I knew I couldn't do this without Emily. She was the whole reason I'd come back to Parsky. I understood why she was hesitant, but this wasn't the Emily I needed right now. I needed the Emily who didn't give a shit and was ready to take a risk. We do this together, or not at all, I said. If you're not going with me, then I won't go. Emily slowly looked up at me. Her eyes beginning to slightly glow in the sun. You're not going to pussy out on me, are you? I said with a grin. Emily chuckled, lightly punching me in the arm. That's my line, loser. The headlights of my car illuminated the gloomy road as I slowly made my way to the meetup spot, the entrance of the long-neglected Parsky Industrial Estate. My stomach did backflips as I drove, the anxiety beginning to creep up into my throat. Here I was, voluntarily returning to a place that had claimed two lives already and had almost taken mine. I must have a death wish, or be crazy, or both. Although I guess there is a third option on that checklist. I must be Emily's friend. 
I saw Emily's car on the side of the road and pulled over behind her, my heart beginning to beat faster in anticipation. I killed the engine and climbed out of the car, the large boots on my feet already beginning to feel way too big for me. My kit included rubber insulated gloves, high visibility pants and top, a high visibility jacket, and a yellow hard hat. I definitely felt more prepared than last time. Whether that would even matter, well, we'd have to find out. Emily was standing with her back against the car door, gazing up at the water tank which loomed over the top of the hill, illuminated by floodlights on either side. You ready? I asked, as I made my way over to her. She jumped slightly, as if jolted out of a trance. Jesus! Emily exclaimed, whipping her head around to face me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. Nice outfit, by the way, she said, giving me a look up and down. Likewise. Emily was kitted up similarly to me, with a pair of bolt cutters she had purchased earlier stuff to do her belt. She took the lead as we began walking up the same route as we had ten years ago, through the decaying industrial estate and to the top of the hill leading up to the water tank. The cold wind whipped out at our backs as our boots crunched over stones. The carcasses of former business hubs passed by as we walked. After slogging through the uphill section, trying to make sure my hard hat wouldn't topple off throughout the journey, we finally made it to the plateau. In front of us lay the tank, surrounded by a chain-link barbed wire fence that extended several feet off the ground. There was a gate in the middle of the fence that appeared to be locked shut. Fortunately, security was nowhere to be seen. Emily got to work cutting a hole in the fence for us to fit through, just as she had done all those years ago. There. Come on, Ty. I ducked my head and climbed through the hole behind her, making sure I didn't get my hard hat caught on the jagged pieces of steel jutting out above me. The tank was waiting for us on the other side. Hey, what the hell are you guys doing? The shout came from behind us. Without thinking, I whipped around to see a balding man with a blue button-up shirt rushing towards us, flashlight in hand. As he came closer into view, I could see that he had a small radio on his breast pocket and a gun holstered to his hip. Security was here after all. Get out of there right now before I call the cops! I immediately put my arms in the air, not wanting to go to jail for what we'd already done, but Emily had other ideas. Well, calm down, pal. We're here to clean the tank, she said, raising her palms into the air to show the guard her gloves. I realized what she was doing and immediately got on board with it, pretending that raising my arms in the air had also been part of showing off my gloves. The guard scratched his head, giving us the once-over with his eyes. Wait, why'd y'all break in then? He exclaimed, pointing at the hole cut in the fence. Well, we were told that you would let us in, but you never showed up, retorted Emily, not missing a beat. Or did you want us to wait all night? The man was clearly caught off guard by all of this and looked unsure of how to respond. They, they didn't tell me. Look, if you need us, we'll be in the tank. Shouldn't be more than 45 minutes, capiche? Emily turned and began marching towards the stairs, leaving me with no choice but to follow her and hope the guard bought our act. The steps beneath me felt a lot more stable than before, but it didn't do anything to ease my anxiety as we reached the top of the tank. The cityscape stretched out beneath us, the lights of Parsky glittering over the horizon. I could never get over how beautiful it looked up here. There was never enough time to enjoy it. I turned back to see Emily fiddling with a small hatch at the center of the roof, holding her flashlight in one hand and the bolt cutters in the other. Here, hold this, she said, handing her flashlight over to me. Uh, what's the problem? There's a handle here, but it won't budge. Emily placed the bolt cutters round the little handle jutting out of the hatch and began to pull with all of her might. The metal groaned and protested, but held strong. Gah! She yelled as the strain became too much, causing her to lose her grip on the tool and fall backwards onto the roof. I moved to help her, but no sooner had she fallen than she was back up again. Stupid thing! Emily shouted, unleashing a devastating kick into the handle. Her foot collided with the metal, causing the hatch to unexpectedly swing open. I couldn't believe what I had just witnessed. I gazed at the hatch in disbelief, then looked back at Emily, who was clutching her foot with a grimace on her face. Are you, like, superhuman or something? I asked, my eyebrows raised. Guess I should get angry more often, 
Emily answered through gritted teeth. Jesus, that hurt. Yeah. Walking over to the now open hatch, I shined my flashlight down into the depths of the tank. There was a ladder descending down into the darkness, but it was quickly consumed by the water below. Well, what do we do now? She said. Wait, I guess. Emily rolled her eyes. That's no fun. Well, what's your suggestion then? She took a deep breath and proceeded to unleash a torrent of abuse at the water. Hey, you old hag! We're here, just like you wanted. Two juicy humans. Now, I know you're more into kids, which is kind of weird if you ask me, but we're yours for the taking. Emily continued to shout into the void as I watched for any kind of movement under the water. The beam of light from my flashlight hovered from one spot to another. Still, there was no head or body that I could see poking above the surface. I was just about to give up when I realized something else was happening. Something slow and methodical. The water level was falling. Hey, stop, stop, I said, raising my hand. Emily's verbal barrage relented. Huh, look at the water. The water was now more than a halfway further down than it had been when he first opened the hatch. Oh shit, how's that happening? Emily asked, suddenly like a child witnessing a magic trick for the first time. I had no idea how it was happening, though if I had to take a guess, I'd say it had something to do with Margie. Come on, come on, let's climb down, Emily said, grabbing the ladder with her hands. I hesitated. Don't you think we should wait until the water stops falling? I mean, you know, there's a, a zombie at the bottom of this tank, don't you? Emily rolled her eyes, then proceeded to lower her legs onto the ladder. Isn't that why we're here? She said, looking up at me. The fact that she was now making her way down without me didn't leave me much choice but to follow her. There were a lot of positives to teaming up with Emily, but the fact that she often gave in to the urge to plunge headfirst into danger was not one of them. I reluctantly pocketed my flashlight and began slowly descending the ladder. The handles were wet and crusty, some covered in rows of barnacles, the darkness seemed to close in around us as we lowered ourselves into the void, and I tried to make a conscious decision not to step on Emily's fingers below me. When we finally made it to the bottom of the ladder, I realized that the water was all but gone now, the floor of the tank now visible beneath us. I let go of the ladder, my feet coming into contact with the solid ground of the tank for the first time in more than a decade. You alright? I asked. Yeah. Did you got your flashlight? As much as I wanted to turn my flashlight on, part of me was reluctant to even do that. I knew what lurked inside the tank. I knew what it was capable of. I pulled my flashlight out of my pocket, but couldn't bring myself to flick the switch. The tool hung in my hand, looking about as useless as a gun without bullets. I wasn't ready to take the shot. But then I felt Emily's hand clutch mine and squeeze it tightly. We do this together, or not at all, right? Emily said, echoing my statement from earlier. I turned to look at her, and saw that she too had her flashlight raised. In that moment, I knew now wasn't the time to be hesitant. It was the time for action. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, I said, grinning in the darkness. On three. Emily responded. I nodded. And we spoke in unison. One. Two. Three. Despite all the planning and equipment we'd undertaken before returning to this horrific place, I wasn't prepared for what I saw when our flashlights came to life. Lying about five feet across from us on the tank floor was a strange, insect-like creature. It was lying on its back with three sets of hairy legs curled in the air. It looked like a gigantic life-sized beetle, except for its body was covered in greenish fur, and well, well, it had three heads. From what I could see, one was larger than the other two, and two had long mandibles extending down from its mouth. Its body was covered in water that appeared to be flowing up into its mouth like it was sucking it in as it slept. Its abdomen was so large that I couldn't see its face, or faces from where I was. The bug looked like some kind of cross between a beetle and an ant, with its rows of spindly legs combined with a huge black abdomen. However, its main head 
looked more ant-like, with long antennae protruding from it and sharp mandibles expanding down from its mouth. The two other heads were sort of molded into the skin of its first, extending out from the left and right sides of its face. It looked nothing like we'd seen the last time we were here. Before Marge had at least looked somewhat like a person. This thing, this thing wasn't human. What the- Before Emily could finish that expletive, the beetle began to convulse violently, twisting its head towards us and letting out an ear-piercing screech. The scream was so powerful that it felt like a gale of wind was blowing through me and my hearing was reduced to white noise. I staggered back as the insect, formerly known as Margaret, twisted its body and stood up on its six hairy legs. It crawled towards us, moving faster than I expected for something of its size. As it came closer, I recognized all three of its faces. In the middle was unmistakably Margaret, but the other two. The one I had seen a thousand times on TV after his death, and the second was my best friend. Tim and Jeremy. Their faces were scrunched next to Marge's, but while hers was twisted into angry snarls, theirs were contorted in what I could describe as intense anguish. They were in pain. The beast let out another screech, somehow even louder than the first, this time rearing up on its hind legs and spraying out some kind of green liquid from its main mouth. I dived out of the way as the mist rained down on us, but barely just missing me. Emily had also managed to jump to safety, landing a foot away from me. I shone my light at the gooey substance that the creature had spewed out and saw that it was sizzling above the ground, eating away at the surface. It was shooting acid at us. Nothing in our toolbox could deal with that. The white noise continued in my ears as I locked eyes with Emily, her face red just like mine. We were out of our depths. I struggled to my feet and helped her up, my knees wobbling beneath me as fear began to consume my body. This was too much to handle. We could at least attempt to subdue a zombie, but there was no way we'd ever be able to get this creature under control. This thing didn't care about a photo. Margaret wasn't even human anymore. What came next was certain evidence of that. The grotesque insect threw back its head, let out a primal shriek, and charged directly at us. At the same time as it roared, showering us with spit, our flashlights blinked and then turned off. It took me a moment to act, the sudden transition to pure darkness catching me off guard. That's why when I did make my move, attempting to dodge out of the way, it was too late. I did make it to the ground, thankful for wearing long sleeves as I skidded along the concrete, but the rough impact was followed by something a lot more painful. I felt a sharp object pierce through my right leg with such force that the air in my lungs exploded out of my mouth, leaving me gasping for air just as Margaret smashed into the wall beside me. My scream caught in my throat as I frantically felt down my leg in the darkness. My hand came to grasp a round, furry object sticking out of my skin just above the knee. I didn't have a chance to try and address my situation because the beast immediately began jerking its leg frantically, carrying me along for a ride. It's hard to accurately describe in words what being on the end of this punishment felt like. If I had to compare it to something, I would say it was like being on a roller coaster ride when the safety harness is just a little too tight except that the safety harness on me was plunging directly into my flesh, digging in further and further as the minutes went by. My hard hat bounced off the floor as I was dragged around like a paper doll, the vibrations causing my world to be turned upside down repeatedly. I heard Emily scream my name somewhere in the darkness, followed by a guttural screech from Margaret. I evacuated my stomach onto the ground, my eyes watering from the pain. Fortunately, in that moment, my survival instincts kicked in. I knew I had to do something or I would die. I couldn't keep going like this. I had to fight back. Knowing there was really only one thing I could do, I closed my eyes and reached behind me with my right hand. My fingers clutched around the handle of the axe that I had bought from the hardware store earlier. With great effort, I pulled it free from my belt, my head still bouncing along the ground. Twisting my body around, I brought the axe down on its leg with as much force as I could muster. The blade sank into the flesh but it didn't feel anywhere close to cutting through. Cursing in the dark, I frantically began hacking away at Margaret's leg, the beast emitting a series of shrill shrieks as I did so. Green ooze that shone in the dark began spurting out of the appendage, coating my arm in its sticky substance. Feeling as if I was about to pass out, I pulled the axe back and brought it down as hard as I possibly could on the already weakened leg. This time, the blade cut clean through, severing Margaret's leg. This finally brought the horror ride to an end. My body coming to rest on the floor. Ty! Emily's voice came from my left, filling me with some form of hope that I might survive despite the impalement. Emily! I called back, my voice catching in my throat and triggering another coughing fit. I'm coming! As I slowly sat up, pain shooting through my mangled leg, I saw Emily clutching a makeshift torch in the distance. As Emily made her way towards me, I looked down and realized two things. One, 
my entire body was glowing in the dark because of the green blood that now covered me. And two, there was still part of the insect's leg protruding above my knee. The sight of the furry stump sticking out from my now glowing green skin was almost enough to actually make me pass out. Oh my god. Light flooded my vision. So intense I had to briefly shield my unadjusted eyes. When my vision came back, I saw Emily leaning over me, her eyes racing side to side as she took in my injuries. Can you stand? Emily stuttered as the beast roared somewhere to our right. My whole body felt like it had been T-boned by a semi, but I tried to climb up with Emily's assistance. As soon as I put pressure on my right leg, it gave out from under me and I collapsed onto the ground. At this point, I knew I was dead weight. I couldn't walk even with Emily's support, and the green blood that covered me was a dead giveaway in the darkness. Emily. I managed to choke out as pain shot up my leg. You have to go. She looked offended by my suggestion, her eyes narrowing as she spoke. I'm not leaving you. Come on. No, look. It's not dead. Emily turned to see what I had been looking at as she was fussing over me. Margaret was now back on her feet, water dripping from her wet fur. The flames from before were completely extinguished. It must have somehow cooled itself with the water that it had sucked up before. Emily put her arms under my shoulders in an attempt to pull me up, but I grabbed her hand with my arm to stop her. L listen, in a few seconds that thing is going to be on me, and I really don't think you want to be here when that happens. Put out that torch and fucking run! In a rare moment, Emily was speechless. I could feel the cogs whirring in her mind as she contemplated what I had just said. But this was no time for calculation. I could hear the unpleasant sounds of Margaret getting ever closer. I couldn't risk losing her too. Go! I barked, desperate to avoid Emily meeting my own fate. A single tear began to roll down her cheek as she reluctantly lowered the torch to the ground. I'm sorry, Ty. I love... Emily was cut off by another shriek coming from our immediate right, and I knew Margaret was almost upon us. Emily's eyes widened as she snapped her neck to the source of the sound. She looked back to me with tears in her eyes before turning away and sprinting off into the darkness. I wondered if that would be the last time I would ever see her. I'd never get to tell her how I felt. But that didn't matter right now. Hey, I'm over here! I called out, my breath crystallizing into small puffs of air. You, you want some? Come get some! I started trying to sound like the hero I often read about in comic books, confident in the face of unimaginable evil. The unsettling sound of the beef's legs scratching against the ground grew louder, and I could smell its foul odor drifting closer. Then the three heads of Margaret, Jeremy, and Tim came into view above me. Its disgusting features lit up by the green liquid covering my body. I closed my eyes and prepared to be disintegrated into a pool of acid. But that wasn't what happened. Instead, I felt two prongs pierce through my shoulders and rip me into the air. Opening my eyes, I came face to face, or should I say, face to faces with the beast. Margaret's mouth opened and she began to lower my body, legs first into it. I screamed, the realization that I was about to be eaten alive, almost too much to handle. I tried to squirm, to wriggle free somehow, but the ends of her mandibles were firmly lodged into my skin. I tried kicking at her face, attempting to drive the stump, still lodged into my leg into her eye, but in response she coiled her abnormally large tongue around me. Then the next thing I knew, I was falling through the air. The feeling of weightlessness enveloped me and I plunged toward the ground. The fall felt like it was going to last forever. My body suspended mid-air like a freeze frame during a movie. It didn't. My body bounced like a soccer ball when I smacked the ground. The impact so great I felt my shoes and socks spring off my feet. Luckily I had landed side on and not head first or anything nasty. But the pain was like anything I had ever felt before. I'd never been seriously hurt as a child, never broken any bones, only a minor sprain here or there. So my first thought as I lay on the ground, tears stinging my eyes from the intensity of the pain was, had I broken anything? That thought was interrupted by the madness my eyes saw when my vision began to focus. The enormous abdomen in front of me was frantically spasming on the ground. The legs were scraping away at something that has obscured from my vision. Suddenly the insect twisted its body towards me and I saw what had transpired. Margaret was trying to scratch her own eye out. Her face was contorted into a panicked grimace as she stabbed at her own bulging eye, which had turned completely red and was spewing green liquid all over the place. As I crawled away, my mind turned to Annie. I wonder if she had seen everything that unfolded tonight. 
if she looked through her eye as Margaret nearly ate me. Her eye. The realization hit me like a cold slap in the face. Annie might have just saved our lives. If her eye was connected to Margaret's, did that mean that she was able to harm her too? Was Annie destroying what remained of her own eye to stop her? As I contemplated that thought, I was hit with a massive blast of light. I squinted my eyes, waiting for them to adjust as my surroundings slowly came into view. When my eyes adjusted, I realized that the light was coming from above, and I could now see the entirety of the tank. I had actually made it pretty close to the ladder for crawling in the darkness. I was only a few feet away from it. I looked up to see the security guard we'd bumped into earlier, descending the ladder. I breathed a sigh of relief and raised my voice to call out to him, but I could only get out enough of a he before erupting into a coughing fit that sent waves of pain coursing through my body. Fortunately, the coughing seemed to catch his attention as he looked down from his possession on the ladder and called out, God damn, stay the hell where you are! Then he turned to look up at the hatch. I found your friend, he's in bad shape! You said there was some sort of massive bug in here too? Well, I don't see it, just, just some woman! I twisted my hand to scan my surroundings that were now lit up by lights that had been installed on the tank walls. My eyes fell on the body of a woman lying motionless, ten feet away from me. Her skin was gray, and a slimy liquid was spilling out of her orifices. Margaret was a beast no more. I quickly whipped my head back to the guard. Don't! Don't go near her! I managed to get out. Don't worry, I'm coming! He responded, making his way down the ladder. I couldn't tell if he could hear me or not, but I couldn't really muster up the strength to shout, lest I trigger another coughing fit. So I just laid there, clutching my broken body as he climbed down to me. Finally, his feet touched the ground next to mine. The guard's bearded face loomed over me, a black beanie now covering his bald skull. He looked like a grizzled veteran, so his almost squeamish response to seeing my impaled leg caught me off guard. Oh man, what is that? He said, stabbing a finger at the hairy appendage protruding from my skin. Trust me. You don't want to know, I responded. You really don't. Emily's face came into view. Her hands clutched close to her chest. She leaned in close to me, wrapping me in a tight hug. I'm never leaving you again. I wanted to respond with some sappy words. I really did. But her embrace compressed my potentially broken ribs, forcing a pained groan out of my mouth. Shit, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Emily said, backing up with a look of concern on her face. I chuckled, which still hurt. Just not as much. I gave her a half smile. Man, am I glad you came back. I didn't want to go in the first place. But you had to. Yeah, I know. That's why I got help. Our conversation was interrupted by the slightly high-pitched voice of the guard. Ma'am? Ma'am, are you okay? I turned my head to see that he was speaking to Margaret, who was now on her feet and slowly shambling towards him. Her gruesome gray body was covered with the same green blood that I was covered head to toe in, but the most striking part of her appearance was her right eye, or rather, the lack of it. There was a bloody hole leaking gray matter where her right eye used to be. Annie's sacrifice. As Margaret's movements became more aggressive, the guard took a step back and reached for his gun. Wait! Wait, don't shoot! I called out to him, despite all she had taken away from me despite the fact that just ten minutes ago she tried to eat me alive. I wanted to make peace. I wanted to help her and fulfill Annie's wish. To set Margaret free. The guard shot me a stunned look. Are you crazy? I grimaced, attempting to get up, but the pain in my chest was too much. Fortunately, Emily wrapped her arm around me, helping me up. I know a lot more about her than you do, I said moving towards Margaret with Emily's support. That caught Margaret's attention. Instead of moving towards the guard, she began to shuffle in our direction. Can you reach in my pocket? I asked Emily, who nodded and stuck her hand inside, pulling out the photo Annie had handed me at the library. The one of Margaret's son. Emily handed me the photo, and I held it up in front of Margaret, who was now in arm's reach, away from it. Margaret! Do you remember Michael? The zombie woman paused as the name Michael left my mouth. Her one good eye twitched as it scanned the photo. 
he he's he's your boy a look of familiarity slowly spread across her face starting from her furrowed brow and ending at her slimy lips she whipped her arm out and for a second i thought she was going to land a blow square on my face but her hand curled around the photo and pulled it free Margaret tentatively raised the photo to her eye, peering at the face of her son. My boy, she said, in a low, raspy voice that sounded nothing like the distorted screams I'd heard from her the last time I was in the tank. It was her real voice. It was the real Margaret. She pressed the photo to her chest and made eye contact with me. Thank you. As the words left her lips, her body began to slowly sink into the ground. A puddle began to form at her feet as she disintegrated, first her legs, then her torso, and lastly, her head. When she finally disappeared, two spirits shot into the air out of the puddle. I looked up in awe as they circled in the sky before shooting off in different directions, and then silence fell on the tank. It was over. Well, whatever that shit was, you two have a lot of explaining to do, the guard said. I looked at him, slowly gave him a thumbs up. And then everything went black. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast. If you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you could happen to listen to podcasts. Also, I just want to take a quick second to tell you guys about HorrorCon VR. HorrorCon VR is actually a horror convention that I'm putting together with a group of my friends who are YouTube horror creators and other horror creators and just sometimes VR chat creators and things like that. You can find out more at HorrorConVR.com or follow us on Twitter at Horror underscore VR. It's going to be hosted on VR chat in October. And the best part is you do not need a VR headset to be able to join and play. So check out those places, join us on Discord, and we do meetups every Saturday, which is fun. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakine, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Rihanna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>